in the long run, there can be no joy for anybody until there is joy finally for us all. When large numbers of people share their joy in common, the happiness of each is greater because each adds fuel to the other's flame. Joy is prayer. Joy is strength. Joy is love. Joy is a net of love that draws people in. Joy is the simplest form of gratitude. The best way to show our gratitude to God and the people is to accept everything with joy. A joyful heart is the inevitable result of a heart burning with love. Never let anything so fill you with sorrow as to make you forget the joy of the Christ risen. Good morning, First Temple. My name is Evan. I am the teaching pastor here. It is so good to be with you today. Uh, And if I don't know you, I would love to get to know you. We have a connection point right through these doors. I will be there after the service. I'd love to meet you. And if you have questions about our church or next steps, or maybe you just need some prayer, that's the place to go. I would love uh, to pray with you. We have other folks there as well. I wanted to begin this morning by by thanking you, my church family, uh, for your prayers and your support for my wife and I. It was 12 days ago that we welcomed twins into our family, and I realized some of you wouldn't listen to anything I said without baby pictures. So here's some baby pictures. On the left, my son, Avit. On the right, our daughter, Lindy. Uh, They're doing really well. They'll be in the hospital for a little bit longer, but they're doing awesome. Um, We're so thankful for the crew at Scott & White and their care and their love. And uh, my three-year-old would be disappointed if they got a shout-out and she didn't. So we're equity here. This is her. She's also awesome. (laughs) When I was little, I I grew up with my mom, my grandparents, and my aunts. And my grandpa was a truck driver. Our, Our house had this driveway that had like a long stretch of it with gravel and then a circular bit. It was kind of like a lowercase letter H. And when my grandpa was out, he was out for long stretches of time. And sometimes when he would come home, he would come home just for a short period of time, maybe to grab a meal or a nap or something like that. And when that would happen, he would pull the truck into that circular part, the lowercase h loop, and park the truck that way so that he could be in and then back on the road. But if he was going to stay... If he was going to be home for a while, he would pull in and then back the truck down the long stretch of the H. We would hear the gravel crunching and look to see how he was parking the truck. My Aunt Randy, maybe 11 or 12, came up with a song that she would sing. As she saw the lights that would back up and the truck come down into the long part of the driveway, she would sing... Papa's home, Papa's home to stay, Papa's home because he pulled in the right way. (laughs) It was a joyful moment when he would come home and we know that he would be staying. But because of the nature of his work, it was unpredictable and sometimes sporadic. And perhaps today, as we think about this idea of joy in our series on joy in the book of Philippians, joy can feel for us sometimes like that too. Wonderful when it happens, but sometimes it seems temporary, sporadic. Maybe today you're saying, I wish I had some more of that joy. So I wrestled with this passage this week I faced my own circumstances, punctuated by the beeps and whirring of machines in a hospital, and all of us together faced grief and pain, seeing what was happening in our world. As another earthquake struck Haiti and they tried to recover in Afghanistan, where people, women and children are in peril, and bombers killed American servicemen and women 
So think about Louisiana, even at this very moment, preparing for another hurricane. As here in our very community, COVID-19 takes more members and wears down our medical resources, we can think, how do we talk about joy? (laughs) Amidst all the seriousness and the heaviness and the challenges, where is the joy? Months ago, we planned to do this series at this time, and we imagined that this fall would look different than it has looked so far. But I believe that God was at work even then, preparing us, reminding us that we need to think about joy. Because as we discover in the book of Philippians, joy is not dependent on our circumstances. Christian joy is not about ignoring the pain in the world or pretending like everything is okay when it isn't. No, in fact, Christian joy is a unique gift that emerges for us as believers when we grasp that despite whatever happens around us or to us, we know that God cares and God acts and that in the end, God wins. There's joy. And there is joy for us when we see how we can join in with the one who has the solution. Today, we will see in the letter of the Philippians that Christian joy can become consistent in our life when we commit to the ways of Jesus, when we commit to God and the power of his spirit, when we embrace unity and humility as we find in Christ. So we'll be turning to the book of Philippians. The Philippian church was dealing with all kinds of division and challenges and fears of their own. In the midst of their challenges, they have sent a gift to their teacher and church planter, Paul, who they love dearly and have found out that Paul is in prison. So they take this large financial gift and they give it to Paul for his ministry and for his time in imprisonment. And then they get a letter back. This is that letter. Perhaps the Philippians were imagining that Paul would receive the gift, be able to be free soon from prison, and then would come and be with them and help resolve some of the tension that was happening in their midst. I really think that might be what they're hoping for, that he would come and he would stay. And I want to pick up the letter in Philippians 1, starting in verse 25. Paul says this. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain, and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. Being with you again. You can imagine the church gathered together hearing this letter read, and they must have gotten pretty excited. (laughs) Paul is coming. Paul is coming. We're having all these challenges, but Paul is coming. And then we get to verse 27. All right, so whatever happens, whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come see and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. Whether I come see you or not, the air must have let the room there in Philippi. Paul says, listen, what matters is that whether I'm there or not, you live in a way that others see that you are worthy for this thing I have told you about, the good news of Jesus. The Philippians discover that Paul in his presence will not solve the issues that are around them, but the thing that will is if they stand on the Spirit of God, the God who is bigger than their problems. And so I think the first thing that emerges for us as we think about our need for joy is to know that our joy will always be sporadic, if it is dependent on other people. Paul is a pretty incredible Christian. He is a super Christian. And yet we discover 
that even Paul will not set all things right for the people in Philippi. He invites them instead to work together as one. And he will explain a little bit about what that looks like, but perhaps you need to hear that this morning. Our joy will always be sporadic if it is based on other mortal fallen people. They will always disappoint us. All of them. And it is not fair to put all of your joy on their shoulders. It is too much to ask. People will disappoint you. Leaders will disappoint you. Pastors will disappoint you. So instead, Paul says, consistent joy is possible when you join together and you strive work together. We're going to read verse 27 again and then on to verse 30. Paul says, whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. Without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you, and this is a sign to them that they'll be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him, And since you are going through the same struggle you saw I have, and now hear that I still have. Paul's saying, look, I'm not magically going to make your suffering and challenges go away. I have those problems too. I'm in prison. And I'm not going to resolve whatever divisions that you may have, whatever push you have from outside, whatever challenges you're facing They likely hoped he would come and see the different sides of the argument, choose their side, and then tell everybody to get lost. And these divisions and challenges and opposition that has cropped up has led them to live in a way towards each other in the world that is damaging what other people see of the gospel and of Christ. It seems that they might be frightened by those who oppose them. And when we are frightened, when we are intimidated, we are so tempted to become defensive, to fight, to avoid and flee, to become self-centered and worried only about our survival. Paul says, no, this is a call to strive and unite. Even in our culture now with Cynicism and skepticism, we can be intimidated. Like, will I look foolish? How can I be defensive towards those around me? How can I run and hide and isolate myself? How can I promote how smart and right I am and how wrong you are? We're really good at that. Paul says, no, you need to stick to what matters. And he's going to break that down even more. And the thing that we see here is that our joy, our joy will be consistent is our commitment to the way of Jesus. Now, as you hear me say that, I don't want you to hear that that means if you are struggling with something that you are not really walking with Jesus. That is not what I am saying. What I am saying is that Christian joy is a gift that is given by God. It is not happiness. It goes beyond our circumstances. And if it is a gift that is given by God, the only way that we can receive it is if we are connected to the God who will give it to us. So we can't expect to have the joy of Christ if we are not connected to Christ. If we are not connected and committed to following his ways and learning from him and taking up his practices. Your joy will be as consistent as your commitment to the way of Jesus. Paul will expound in chapter 2. Verse 1. Therefore, he says, if you have any encouragement from being united in Christ, If you have any comfort from his love, any common sharing in the spirit, any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete, my joy full by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. Not looking to your own interests, but to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. And then he'll break that down shortly. If you have any encouragement, if any common sharing, 
if any, tenderness and compassion. We could translate that if also as because since you have these things, the people hearing this would have said, of course we have those things, Paul. Of course we have those things. Didn't you not realize we just sent you a very large check? Did it not hit your bank account? Have you not seen all the zeros? Of course we have these things. My daughter just recently, this week, started this new thing where she says, Daddy, because I love you, will you? She's really good. She's really good. Paul says, if you have these things, if you are encouraged by Christ, if you share this love, they're like, yes, we do. Yeah, we sent you the check. What are you talking about? And Paul's saying, yeah, that's great. But if you really want to show me this stuff matters to you, if you really want to make my joy full and complete, be like-minded. Have the same love. Be of one spirit and one mind. That is, be united. Now, unity, of course, does not mean uniformity. It's not about sameness and it's all looking and acting exactly the same. No, that is not what it means. It means in our diversity, we are united around the same mission, We have the same goal, the same vision. We are all committed together to row in the same direction and we're going towards the way of Jesus. He says, if you really want to show me this matters to you, if you really want to find complete joy, look not to your own interest, but to the interest of others. That's humility. That's the gift that will truly, truly bless me, Paul says, unity and humility, when you give that gift, you bring about joy. Can you be humble? Can you be one? Uh, in high school, we lived uh, in Germany. Uh, my dad was stationed there in the army, and we decided to go to the circus. So I kind of imagine like a circus with a tent, like a standard circus in Europe. They do circuses very differently. There was a flyer, but it was in German, and I couldn't read it, so we just went. And in the middle of this bizarre acrobatic circus, they brought out this metal sphere. It was this giant metal sphere. You could see through it. That's what it looks like. It's called the Globe of Death, which I think is an awesome name, the Globe of Death. And then one by one, these guys on dirt bikes got into the Globe of Death and began to drive very fast in circles all around each other. This kind of wild orchestrated event. They were going all over the place. It was wild. I thought for sure they're going to crash. They did not crash. Luckily, it was not really a globe of death. I tell you this because when Paul says to these people, complete my joy, He's saying, I want you to do something that is so coordinated, so beautiful, so incredible. It will kind of astonish people. You know, in the globe of death, no writer tried to be the star of the show. (laughs) Nobody acted out to try to get their own attention. They each had to work together on their goal. They had to be in sync or else things would go poorly. (laughs) They did their part. It was incredible to watch. And I believe in our world right now, if we were to act as a people who were humble and united, it would be a better show than the globe of death. It would be more beautiful, more coordinated, more impressive. Paul says, live in this way and it makes my joy complete. And we may think that's an odd way to phrase it. It's like a coach coming in at halftime and saying, win the game and win it for me. And the players are like, well, we want to win it for us. (laughs) But see, as Paul was often writing to the churches that he had invested in as their mentor, he talks about himself as a representative of Christ for them. He says, when you make my joy complete, that means they're also completing, filling the joy of God, God's desire for us. And as Paul says, you will share in my suffering, you will also share in my joy. And so that means, That if we are completing the joy of Paul, we are also completing the joy of each other, our own joy. Paul's invitation is for full, complete joy for all of us. It is the vision for God's people. Not to be dependent on others, but to be committed to the way of Jesus and to pick up his unity and his humility. Joy becomes consistent 
when we commit by the power of God's spirit to unity and humility within our community. When we look for the interests of others over our own, we all do that together and then others are meeting our needs while we meet theirs. We refuse to hide in defensiveness or avoidance or self-centeredness. This is countercultural, and it always has been. In Philippi, the most important thing in that culture at the time was honor, was being the best. One philosopher from that time writes, By nature, we yearn and hunger for honor, and there is nothing we are not prepared and suffer for in order to secure it. Uh, My family knows this about me. I really dislike board games that are only based on chance. We went on a vacation. I learned how to play a bunko. It's like a dice game. And it's just you roll and you hope that you win. I do not like games like this because I want to win because I beat you. (laughs) This is a character flaw that I have. I'm aware. I want to win because I did better than you. I would fit well in Philippi. Humility is counterculture. I mean, listen, we're Texans. Humility is hard. I remember moving to Texas and seeing the commercial for Dairy Queen. That's what I like about Texas. Dairy Queen's from Illinois. They just have really good marketing people that know that Texans care about their pride. To live in humility is countercultural. But perhaps even a bigger challenge for us is a call to unity. We like unity if it's everybody else deciding to agree and unite with us. But it's hard. In our country today, economists and sociologists have called a trend that is happening the big sort. So where people are moving into more and more self-isolating situations because we now have the freedom to move about. We're not so tied to the places where we were born. People are, are actually going to communities where they agree and find people who already agree with them so they can have these things in common and just isolate themselves. We see it in politics. In 1976, less than one quarter of all Americans lived in a county where the presidential election was a landslide. A landslide meaning at least 60% of the vote went to one candidate or the other. That was in 1976. In 2020, 58% of Americans lived in counties that were landslides. One analyst would say it like this. People are unwilling to live with trade-offs. So they are recreating their environments to fit what they want in all kinds of ways. (laughs) One of the ways is they're finding communities that fit their values where they don't have to live with neighbors or community groups that might force them to compromise their principles or their tastes. We do this physically. We do this digitally. How are we supposed to be united? You can imagine these believers in Philippi, divided and isolated, frustrated. They send this big gift to Paul. Paul says, thank you. You know what would be awesome? If you lived with unity and humility, (laughs) ouch. And then, masterfully, Paul takes their own words and gives them back to them. In verses 6 through 11, we find what is often called the Christ hymn. Scholars really think that most likely verses 6 through 11 is Paul taking what might have been a common worship song of the time, a song that worshipers in the early church would have sang about Christ and who he is. Paul takes this song and quotes it back to them. He says, I want you to have this unity, this humility, the mind of Jesus. And so he gives them a song that they would have known, perhaps would have sang right before the letter would have been read. He says, you have sang these things. Do you live like it? Look at the unity and the humility of Christ. Center your life on it, and that will produce joy. Joy that is consistent. I want to read Philippians 2, 6 through 11. Paul says, have the same mind as Christ Jesus, who being the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. Rather, he made himself 
nothing. By taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. By becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of God, the Father. This is what humility and unity looks like. Have this mind. That Jesus would do this for us. Though he is one with God, he did not consider his standing with God as something to use for his own advantage, but he poured himself out to fill our joy. He gave himself up for us. He laid down his life. He came to be united with us and was killed, paid the price for our sins, and now invites us to new life forever. This is humility And this is unity, the God of the universe, willing to become like us. Can you imagine what that would be like? You can't. (laughs) You can't imagine such extreme humility, although I like the way that C.S. Lewis puts it. He says, if you want to get the hang of this picture, of this picture of God becoming flesh, then imagine how you would feel if you woke up one morning to to discover you've turned into a garden slug. This is that transfer that God would humble himself to this extreme measure for us to be united with us. This is our example. How could we not be humble? How could we not unite around this vision? Because this vision is better than all the things that frustrate us. This vision is more beautiful and more powerful. This vision is a vision of hope and promise that looks at the pain and the fear in the world and says, I know, and it is real, and God did something about it, and Jesus is better. Consistent joy comes from our awareness to our consistent source of joy, Jesus. So as we gather as a church this morning and think about joy, it is not so that we might be distracted from the world around us. It is not so that we might pretend that things aren't hard or frightening out there. Instead, it is a time that we unite. And we humble ourselves and we discover again that the God who would go to such lengths to be with us forever is with us now. That we remind each other and encourage one another that the joy of the Lord is our joy. Not because things aren't hard out there, they are, but because the God of the universe has entered into the frightening circumstances for us. He is with us. And he will defeat them all once and for all. It is reality and it is a promise and it is so good. All we can do is sing about it. Perhaps you've been looking for another person to provide joy for you. Know that Jesus gives all the joy we can handle. We can sing about it. Like a child watching her father come home from a long time away. But knowing that Jesus is home with us. He never left us. He'll be with us forever. This is good news. Do you value it enough to live with humility, to be united, to have the same mind as Jesus? Shall we make our joy complete? Can we pray together? Lord, in this moment, we together, your church, unite. And we unite together in prayer. Lord, we pray for the people of Haiti and the devastation that has occurred there. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for Afghanistan, for those who have lost or will lose because what is happening there. Lord, hear our prayer. Together, we unite. We pray for Louisiana together. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for our country and our community specifically as we walk through this battle with COVID-19. For our healthcare workers, Lord, we pray. For the sick, Lord, we pray. For those who have lost, Lord, we pray. And as we are united in prayer, Lord, we ask where we lack humility, you would humble us. And Lord, where each of us might lack unity, would you unite us? 
And as those voices and things that push us to be proud and disconnected, Lord, may you silence those voices and may we flee from them. And may you remind us of your call, your love, and your joy. A joy that is worth singing about. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.